Good day, everyone. Welcome to our weekly talk on cardiac devices and EP general. Here we have um, AJ Hale, a certified device specialist based in Cambridge. He works for Dennis. Uh, he works for the Dennis in Jane Reese Foundation and volunteers with the Cardiovascular Education Foundation. So he'll be taking us on the topic, um, discussing electrical concepts of pacing. I uh, would like you to kindly pay attention. If you have questions along the line, please drop your questions. Uh, you could um, send the chat and we'll pick it up from there. Um, otherwise, uh, perhaps you could, except you're part of the panelist, you might, we might not hear you. You could also raise your hand and uh, we could stop the talk and allow your question to, to come in. So, um, happy listening, everyone. Thank you, AJ. Welcome. Over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much for that introduction, um, Elvis. So, I uh, like I said, we moved to this new webinar format so we can allow for additional features like polls and surveys. Um, and I've actually created a few for this week. So, it would be fantastic if you're able to participate with these. Um, I, I won't be um, I won't be mad if you don't, but I will be disappointed. So if you're able to uh, to hop in and participate with some of these polls, just so we can all stay engaged, that'd be fantastic. Um, as we announced in the group, uh, the original speaker was going to be Jared Shaw, but he had a, some urgent issues arise. So I'm your substitute. Normally in the US substitutes will show a movie, but unfortunately uh, for you all, I've already had a presentation in the, in the wings ready to get started. So we'll go ahead and just kick this off without further ado. And then if you have any questions, like I said, please uh, raise your hand in the chat so that we're able to uh, to uh, allow you to speak or to uh, post them directly into the chat if you have questions as well. You can do it anonymously or in person. This is all about engagement. So let's just uh, keep this all rolling. So before we get started, um, I've never done one of these polls before, so we're going to make sure it works. But here is the first poll question. If you're able to jump in and answer some of these questions uh, for me, these are just review of the previous talk we did on pacemaker mode selection. So first one we have, um, Elvis, are you able to see this poll? Is anyone on the mobile able to see it at all? Yes, it's visible. Okay, perfect. Looks like we're already getting some answers coming in. So asynchronous pacing modes. So what do what do they include? Uh, DDI, VVI pacing, trigger pacing should um, should not be used because they can uh, to avoid inhibition. Sorry, or they can be pro rhythmic. Looks like we already have one answer. Please feel free to answer there. We have four total questions. So just make sure to go through them all. Once everybody gets your answers in, we can uh, get a quick review. Just remember there's four questions. So if you answer the first one, please answer the next three. All right. Well, we're still having some answers file in. If you can answer the following questions, that'd be great. We'll go ahead and kick off the first one. Um, so first question, asynchronous pacing modes. Um, it looks like a number of you said includes DDI and VVI pacing. The most popular though was can be prorhythmic. The answer is can be prorhythmic. So um, DDI or sorry, asynchronous pacing modes are going to be your DOO or VOO pacing modes. And what that means is that um, the device is going to be pacing no matter what in either the ventricle or the atrium. It's not going to sense as a response or not going to sense anything that's going on and it's not going to respond to that sensing at all. So it would not be the DDI and VVI because these will say 
in this case, for example, it'll pace in the atrium and the ventricle, it'll sense the atrium and the ventricle, and it will inhibit. Um, asynchronous would be DOO or VOO instead. So not this answer. Um, trigger pacing uh, based on the intrinsic activity. Once again, um, asynchronous is not going to pay attention to anything that's going on in the heart at all. It's just going to pace asynchronously no matter what at the indicated rate. So at the base rate of 60, it'll go you know, 60 beats a minute nonstop. So the reason we will use this is to uh, say, for example, if the patient is going in for surgery and we're worried that the cautery could cause inhibition. The device uh, can be programmed DOO and it will just continue to pace so we don't have to worry about the patient not getting the support they need. Um, it can, however, be prorhythmic. So that is one thing I'd like to note is that because the device is not sensing the intrinsic activity, it could pace into a vulnerable zone and could kick off an arrhythmia either in the atrium or more uh, dangerously in the ventricle. So we don't like to leave patients uh, DOO or VOO long-term. Um, if you do set them asynchronous, make sure to set it at a higher base rate than their intrinsic. So if their intrinsic is 70 beats a minute, go 85 or 90 asynchronous to um, overdrive pace and inhibit um, over the top of um, what could be going on underneath. Um, it also avoids PVCs coming in at the wrong time. All right, question two. NBG code third position indicates um, everybody who answered said how the device will respond to sensing that is dead on. So remember your first of the NBG code, um, the first position would be where it paces. The second position is where it senses. And the third position is how it responds to that sensing. Finally, the fourth position will be um, rate modulation. So perfect answers on that. Looks like we got a little bit of a, um, uh, looks like people have a little, you know, separation of answers here in dual, dual chamber pacing. Um, does it, sorry, uh, dual chamber pacing causes pacemaker syndrome. Looks like about a quarter of you answered that one. Um, encourages atrial synchrony. About half of you answered that one. And then um, can be done with a single pass or VDD lead. About a quarter of you answered that one. And no one voted for does not allow dual chamber uh, sensing. So once again, dual chamber pacing, of course, does allow dual chamber sensing, um, as long as you're programmed in that mode, obviously. Um, it can be done with a single pa pass lead. It cannot. Uh, single pass lead um, will not pace in the atrium. It is only pacing in the ventricle. So VDD leads will only pace in the ventricle and sense in the atrium. So um, cannot be done with a single pass lead. Um, causes pacemaker syndrome. Actually, it's quite the opposite. It encourages uh, atrial synchrony, which reduces the instant of pacemaker syndrome. So the answer is encourages atrial synchrony. Um, great on that. Finally, the NBG code stands for, looks like most of you said NASPY, BPEG, generic. Uh, the actual answer is it really doesn't matter. Uh, no, it, it is actually NASPY, BPEG, generic, but unless you're taking the IBHRE, the most important thing is to remember what those codes stand for. Um, if you are taking the IBHRE, that's what it stands for, the NASPY, BPEG, generic. And if you ask me what NASPY, BPEG is, I, I don't know. I've never bothered to dig that deep into it, but the important thing is to... Uh, is to just remember what the positions and the codes mean. So fantastic. I appreciate everyone for uh, for participating in that. And I'll go ahead and share the answers. Looks like I should have done that before, but hey, we're all learning together, right? All right. So to kick it off, we have different types of lead. And then once again, if you have any questions in the chat, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, Elvis, if you can kind of monitor that just because I can't physically see it, um, and then chime in if you uh, if you have anything at all for me. So uh, right. types, sorry. Oh. No, I said all uh, right, just uh, Sounds okay. great. All right, so types of leads. Um, this is just gonna be a quick overview. We're gonna go into a deeper dive later, but the types of leads, you'll have your passive fixations. You can see they have these tines here to catch the trabeculation. Uh, the right atrium, right ventricle, both have Quite a, uh, quite a high degree of trabeculation that it can get actually caught into. Um, so these passive leads can just get caught up in there and make good contact. They tend to have large electrode um, you know, presence here, a large electrode surface area, and then um, the bipolars will have a bipole 
um, electrode here. Um, over here, you have an epicardial lead. You have the sew-in patch. You have the screw-in. This is like a great batch screw-in. This is probably um, one of these is a Medtronic sew-in. Um, these would be placed on the outside of the heart. So obviously, you're probably not going to be doing a ton of these unless you're doing open heart surgery. Um, so there are ways to do a window to get access to the heart without actually cracking the chest, but you're not going to see a lot of these. Uh, they are a good solution for patients who are occluded and who need pacing. Um, next, you have your extendable helix and or fixed helix leads. Uh, you're right here is an extendable retractable helix. Uh, you can see a fixed it just stays out the entire time. Uh, we'll go into deeper detail on how to tell when the helix is fully extended in a later lecture. But for example, for a Abbott lead, you're looking for a W. I believe Boston is similar. Medtronic, you're actually looking at the spacing here. All of these leads come with little instruction manuals in the boxes. So um, you can read that instruction manual. It'll tell you, you know, how to tell if it's extended, how to tell, um, you know, how the lead is functioning. Um, so quick question here. We'll go ahead and start our next one. Obviously, I got a little happy with these polls. If you can answer this one for me, where is the anode located in bipolar pacing? So we have this question here, where's the anode located bipolar pacing, tip electrode, ring electrode, device, or body tissue? You want to chime in? Looks like we got a couple answers already. So far, it looks like we're kind of split down the middle here between tip electrode and ring electrode. Nobody's voting for device, which is dead on. Okay. We'll go ahead. We got enough votes here. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Here's the results for y'all. So uh, half of you said it's a tip electrode. Half of you said it's the ring electrode. It is the, um, it, your anode is gonna be your ring electrode here. So the answer is going to be B, ring electrode. Your cathode is going to be your tip. Um, so if you look at these leads, the traditional unipolar lead is going to be a uh, single uh, conductor. So multiple lumen single, single conductor. Um, the original bipolar leads are going to be side by side conductors. So it was actually two conductors covered insulation right next to each other. The more modern ones actually wrap the ring anode um, conductor coil on the outside of the, um, the tip. Uh, what that means is this is actually going to be one of your earliest failure points because there's less insulation and it's just the one that is going to receive the most trauma if there's any kind of subclavian um, crush or anything going on. So if you ever have a failure with a bipolar lead, um, always make sure to check unipolar polar or unipolar capture and sensing and things like that, um, because unipolar may work just fine. Um, it may just be the ring electrode that's affected. And then when you go to unipolar, of course, you're running from the tip to the can. So your circuit's going here. It's cutting the um, anode of the ring out of the equation and making the anode the can. Perfect. All right. Let me move along here. Any questions from the group, Elvis? Um, none yet. Okay, perfect. All right. So, um, who's the sorry. Sorry. Can I can I say something about your first slide, the um, epicardial leads? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I had an experience here in Nigeria, maybe perhaps twenty nineteen, on the epicardial lead. Um, one of the surgeons was implanting. I, well, I think he, yeah, he was implanting an epicardial lead for a pediatric patient who had a congenital heart disease and affected the AV block. I think they did a surgery, so, sorry, caused an AV block post-op. So he had to implant an epicardial lead. And um, okay. I remember that they, uh, there was an issue since um, testing the lead during the implant. And that was my first experience anyway, but I... We, we, I sort of discovered that it was traditionally a unipolar lead. So, you know, during the implants, we traditionally would do the uh, bipolar sensing and testing method, where the uh, black to ring, uh, the red, to, sorry, red to ring, black to tip, the um, PSA cables. So that was what was traditionally done until I looked at the lead again and uh, I discovered it was a unipolar lead. So it's possible that, especially for those who work in the cardiothoracic uh, or centers where they have surgical 
pediatric surgical cases um, that might require pacing um, because according to him, he had done one before. So I think that case was the second. I don't know how many he has done after that, placing the epicardial leads in Nigeria. So okay. uh, I might just be wary of that note that they're usually unipolar leads. So you have to test them um, using the unipolar approach where the, the, the um, I think the, the ring, the red goes to the skin and the black stays on the tip. So that way you get to see, you're able to test for your thresholds and sensing. And that was what we did and it, it worked out. Yeah, I just said I should mention that. No, that's, that's dead on. Um, so I, I, I appreciate you chiming in with that because yes, you're going to see, um, I think it's the Medtronic R unipolar. I'm trying to remember, I think they do make a bipolar yeah. as well. It's a Medtronic lead. It yeah. was a Medtronic lead there. Yeah, so they do make a bipolar as well. Um, and it usually has two sew on patches. This great batch is actually a bipolar um, as well. This active fixation, you actually screw in the helix. Um, but say if you're looking at your pin here from this amazing diagram that I've drawn for you, this is just the lead body. This would be the pin tip that sticks out. Um, this will be your black tip. So you're going to hook your black alligator cables to the tip. And then if it's a bipole, that is going to be your ring electrode. However, as he's saying, if this is a uh, unipolar lead, there will not be the uh, place to hook the red uh, anode uh, alligator cable. So you'll want to click, click hook that to either the body, the tissue um, inside the pocket, or something metal that's touching the pocket that will um, close the circuit. Spot on. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Goals of cardiac pacing. So um, basically, you know, just going high level here. Um, you know, management of Brady requires capturing, so the ability to deliver enough energy to consistently depolarize the heart and sensing the ability to correctly in a sense intrinsic cardiac activity. We, the reason we say correctly here is because um, obviously, you know, you can sense um, other activity as well, like myopotentials or noise in the lead, things like that. Um, so you can usually program around that with accurate sensing. So correctly is, is important. We need to see what's going on in the heart and we don't wanna see all these other things that could be convoluting it. So things that can affect this, it could be your output parameters when you talk about capture and sense, uh, could be your sensitivity, uh, could be your impedance, could be any kind of other electrical things. And I just remembered that we have another quiz for you here. So before I get too far, why don't we just start this quiz? Because I worked very hard on these this morning. So pacing output is expressed as pulse amplitude and pulse width, pacing voltage and pacing ohms, pacing current and milliseconds, and the real base and the chronaxi. So far, got a couple people chiming in. I'm so glad you all are doing these polls, by the way, because I spent a lot of time on them this morning. So more than I should admit spending time on this. All right. Got a bunch of folks chiming in. Give it a few more seconds here. Okay. That's our requisite. Well. Two more seconds, we still got some coming in. All right, once again, these are anonymous, so no one's judging you, at least publicly. Um, all right, so pacing output is expressed as, let me share these answers here, is expressed as um, pulse amplitude and pulse width. This is actually the answer. It's gonna be your pulse amplitude and pulse width, um, pacing voltage and pacing ohms. Uh, I was kind of messing with you here. It is pacing voltage is one way to express it, but pacing ohms is actually a different measurement. Pacing current and milliseconds. Once again, pacing current is not, eh, not really the answer here. Um, that's actually the amount of drain that comes off of the, uh, the battery. And then milliseconds would be your other uh, equivalent of pulse width. And then Rio base and Cronaxi, we'll go over that in a second. But uh, yes, it's pacing amplitude or voltage and pulse width or milliseconds. All right, move this over here and move on. Um, I kind of gave you the answer right here. That's why I quickly backtracked, but um, that is gonna be your outputs. 
All right, so capture, do you do a little bit deeper dive? Threshold is defined as the minimum amount of electrical energy required to consistently depolarize the myocardium. The reason we say consistently is because, um, you know, you may capture um, inconsistently, but that's not considered the threshold. The threshold is where you're having consistent capture. So if you say, hey, I'm capturing 75% of the time, um, you know, that's not your threshold. Your threshold is going to be a margin above that. Uh, what can happen? Respiration, things like that. You may see intermittent capture, lead failure, any number of things um, can, can affect that. So when a pacemaker output causes a polarization, this is also called capture. And it's kind of all repetitive here. Um, so capture threshold is also called the stimulation threshold or the amount of energy it costs to count. It takes to stimulate the heart. Um, just remember, capture threshold is not constant. It can change over time. So um, their medications, their age, tissue damage, any number of things can change. It can change over the course of a day. This could be, um, you know, any number of electrolyte imbalances, anything like that. It can even change by the minute. And that could be things like respiration, um, position. So how they're sitting, uh, especially with like your left ventricular leads, for example, you know, it, it, position can make a difference in both um you know, at cardiac stem or, um, sorry, um, uh, like stem, um, of your diaphragm, diaphragmatic stem or capture itself. So just remember that capture threshold is not consistent. Let me go back to my quizzes here. Okay. So I have another question for you here. Capture thresholds tend to do what at implant? So rise as current injury falls, fall as current injury falls, current of injury has no association with threshold. Once again, capture threshold is the amount of energy it takes to depolarize the heart or to capture the tissue at the heart to stimulate. So um, with current of injury, do we tend to see capture thresholds rise as the current of injury comes down? to fall as current injury comes down, or there is no association. Right now we're 50-50. All right, votes are coming in. I'm just gonna pour myself a cup of coffee while this happens. Okay. So um, we'll give it a couple more seconds, but it looks like there's a, you know, Everyone uh, has a different opinion on this one. So we'll go ahead and end the poll. I'll show you the results here. All right. So 30% um, of you said it's going to rise as current in injury falls. 40% uh, said it's going to fall as current of injury falls. And 30% said current of injury has no association. The answer is going to be, and once again, these are never 100%, but you'll tend to see the uh, capture threshold come down as the current of injury falls. So fall as current of injury falls. Um, we will, let me stop sharing this here. All right, move along and I'll go into deeper detail, but it's good to see all this. Okay. There we go. All right. We'll get to current of injury here in a second, but um, we're going to go ahead and talk about your Rio base and your Conaxi here. Uh, this is going to be your IBHRE talk. So uh, we'll, uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I skipped a poll here. Yeah, it's probably fine. Uh, okay. So I, so we, we're here talking about output. <clears throat> Let me just see if this is the correct one. We'll wait for that one. I'll go ahead and let that poll run in the background. All right, so output parameters. So as we talked about, your pulse width is going to be your voltage or the amount of energy that your uh, device is putting out. So your, your voltage is a measurement there. Um, you have your pulse width, which is the total amount of time that you're giving that, that voltage out. And that's measured in milliseconds. So when we establish uh, what capture is, that's, uh, or your capture threshold that's going to be defined and in voltage and milliseconds. So looking here at this little chart, hey, uh, why does sorry, it matter? Do you see how the pole put up? Sorry? Is the pole still up? Uh, yeah, it's so still up. You can see your screen properly. Okay, oh. I guess you have to. 
Uh, let me end the poll then. We'll come back to this poll. Sorry about that, everyone. We're still working with learning how to do polls and by we, I mean myself. So uh, <clears throat> let's see here. I think there's an extra slide. All right, so here is your, what's called strength and duration curve. Um, everything above this line here is going to be capture. Everything below this little curve here is going to be uh, non-capture. So here's the curve that really matters. These don't really matter as much. I don't know why they're here, but uh, this is one of the best demonstrations we could find of the strength and duration curve. On this side, you have the amount of voltage that you're putting out. On this side, you have the amount of time that you are giving that voltage. And why this curve matters here is you can see there's a relation um, between pulse width and voltage, and it doesn't really matter after a certain point how long you give um, energy for. So it could be one millisecond, it could be one second. If you don't have enough voltage, it will not capture the tissue. This is this curve is not going to be the same with every patient. It's not going to be the same within every patient too, because obviously capture thresholds can change over time, but this will be like your moment in time uh, measurement here. So as you can see, uh, there is a stronger relation between the amount of voltage that you give. This curve will just continue on. It will never hit zero, but there's a strong relation to the amount of voltage you give um, and its ability to capture. So you don't actually, you know, as you up the voltage, the less time you actually have to um, give that energy to capture the tissue. But after a certain point, if you lower the voltage, it doesn't matter how long you give it, it will not capture. So um, back in the day, and the reason why I'm showing you all this um, is because it will come up in the IBHRE, people would calculate the Rio base and the Cranaxi. So your Rio base is the minimum current required to depolarize a nerve given an infinite duration of stimulation. So you're going to essentially um, find the point where it doesn't matter how long you extend your pulse width, it will no longer capture the tissue. From there, you will double the Rio base. So say we take it at around 1.1 or something like that. 1.1, we'll call it that. So we'll double that. That will make this 2.2 volts, right? And then from there, where 2.2 intersects with the curve, we'll find um, how long your optimal pulse width will be right? So you find the point where no longer extending the pulse width will no longer affect capture. You double that to find your voltage and where it intersects, then the answer would be 2.2 at, sorry, I'm right-handed or left-handed at two, sorry, 0.2 milliseconds. Once again, we have 2.2 volts at 0.2 milliseconds will be your chronaxi. Um, no one really does this anymore. I'll be honest with you. A lot of times you'll see the uh, pulse width set at 0.4 off the bat uh, for Abbott, for Medtronic, it's usually 0.5. Um, and then for Abbott, high voltage devices is 0.5. Um, a lot of people will just leave it at that. Um, things to remember though, is that your pulse width depends or your total current drain or the amount of energy that it drains from the battery is highly dependent on the uh, manufacturer itself. So um, I'm gonna use Abbott as an example because I'm an Abbott expert, I'm not a Medtronic expert. The Abbott devices in their low voltage devices have a um, voltage doubler above 2.5 volts. So that means if you set the output at 2.75 volts, you will have a double um, drain on the uh, on the current, which means that you're making a massive impact on the battery longevity. So in those cases, you want to try to extend the pulse width out as long as possible, um, or as long as you need to, to get the, um, the output below 2.5 volts. So for example, you may have a capture threshold of, um, you know, 1.7 at, um, let's say um, 0.5 volts or 0.5 milliseconds, 1.7 volts at 0.5 milliseconds. Um, if you double that, obviously you're going to be above your 2.5 um, voltage doubler. So what you'll want to go ahead and do is test it at maybe 0.8, test it at one and see what your threshold is. It may be, you know, um, 1.7 at 0.8, but at one, you find it to be 1.25. So in that case, 
you would want to go ahead and set it at 1.25, or sorry, um, if your threshold is 1.25 for the threshold, you would want to get your two times safety margin makes it 2.5 at 0.8 milliseconds. So um, what you're trying to do is get your two to one margin here, but uh, stay below the voltage doubler. With Medtronic devices, from my understanding, um, extending out your pulse width has a different effect on the on the battery. So you just want to go ahead and see how much your current drain is or evaluate um, based on the device's predict uh, prediction of longevity. So uh, I know that was a little convoluted. I kind of got in the weeds a little bit there. So if you have any questions, raise your hand or just reach out to me directly on the side and we can talk through it. If you have questions about optimizing a battery, you see that this battery is draining faster than it should. Um, there could be a number of things affecting it, but it could very well be that your outputs are just higher than they need to be. So always make sure to maintain your two to one safety margin um, or use some sort of um, automated capture algorithm but remember that there are things you can do like adjusting pulse width, adjusting voltage, um, or um, you know, turning on automated algorithms that could save you some battery in the long term. So just to show you, uh, this is gonna be a passive fixation lead, but um, when we talk about the electrode tissue interface, you have the electrode itself, you have the virtual electrode, which is just the area just outside the electrode, you have tissue that's not excitable, um, and then you actually have the excitable tissue that you're capturing here. Um, so acute to chronic threshold was something that was a much bigger deal back in the day, because when you use um, especially active fixation leads, you cause trauma to the tissue. So we, um, we were much more concerned with, you know, your initial threshold and more concerned with thresholds rising over time. I'm going to go ahead and start the Q&A here. Sorry, the poll here. Uh -huh. Okay, there we go. Let's get back to this one. So before we get to the next slide, people had a question, uh, raising sensing thresholds. Um, I'll go ahead and share the results here. Only a few got a chance to answer, but raising the sensing threshold uh, makes the device more sensitive, makes the device less sensitive, does not change how the device senses. Uh, the answer is it does um, make the device less sensitive. And we'll go into that here in a second. But current of injury. All right. So I wanted to go ahead and show you this current of injury here when we talked about uh, fixation. So with active fixation leads, you're causing physical trauma to the tissue itself. Um, and what that does is it actually can look something like on the on an EGM. So on your um, near field EGM, your unfiltered EGM, something like um, a STEMI, right? You have a widening of your QRS. You have a... Um, you could have some sort of uh, T wave, um, and like uh, sorry, ST segment elevation as well. Um, all of these things indicate that you've caused localized damage to the tissue. Um, what that actually indicates is that you probably screwed into healthy tissue, um, and that you probably have good fixation. So, data is showing, and feel free to click on this later. I'm gonna when I send out the um, the PowerPoint, but data shows that current of injury is associated with uh, better outcomes long-term. So having a more apparent current of injury um, will, uh, will indicate whether or not the lead has a, a good fixation and will have a good threshold long-term. So when you're evaluating current of injury, uh, some of you, we've done procedures together in, in Lagos and Abuja. Um, you may hear me call out, oh, current of injury looks good, current of injury looks bad, things like that. Um, these are ways to indicate at fixation whether or not the um, the lead has good tissue contact. And for, you know, our, our, um, our cardiac physiologists here, this is a way for you to help out your implanting physicians and let them know, you know, how, where they're at, um, as far as lead implantation. So right here, we have our typical EKG, right in here, we have our EGM, we have a good indication of current of injury here, we have a QRS widening here, we have um, sort of ST segment elevation, this indicates that we have a good injury current or we have good fixation in place. A negative injury current 
that means you may have actually uh, perforated. So um, if you ever see a negative injury current and they have correctly hooked up, um, you know, black to tip, red to ring, and the injury current is negative, we um, might suspect there could be a perforation and you should act accordingly. So always keep an eye out if you're seeing these negative, um, you know, QRS or, you know, negative um, complexes here on your narrow, on your near field EGM, that indicates there could be an issue. Um, finally, poor fixation. We're just not seeing this widening of injury in the ST segment or the QRS. You may not see, you know, the T wave amplitude rise, anything like that. So if you ever see on the near field, just a very narrow signal like this, this indicates poor fixation or you're fixated into dead tissue. Um, you may hear the term dead meat, don't beat. It also doesn't really give off much injury as well because there's just not um, any live tissue to traumatize. So uh, just to review, one of the best predictors of threat uh, stability long-term, look for QRS widening or ST segment elevation and an unfiltered EGM channel. Um, if there's a negative current of injury present, um, just make sure that one, you've hooked up your cables correctly. So black to tip, uh, red to ring. And if that's the case, then you suspect perforation. A fun little trick I learned from a physician in uh, New Hampshire is that unipolar impedance is expected to be lower than bipolar impedance, which makes sense, right? Um, so if your unipolar impedance exceeds your bipolar impedance, that could indicate perforation. So anytime you suspect this, what you may ask the physician to do is, okay, can we take the red off of the ring and hook it to the tissue? If the impedance rises going unipolar, that indicates the tip of the lead is actually through the myocardium, um, and that is bad. So um, that's just a quick little trick to say, oh, I got a negative current of injury. Let's check unipolar impedance versus bipolar. Any questions for me there? Nope. No question. Yes. Okay. So threshold values. Um, so here I just kind of laid out a table. These are a rule of thumb. It's not law here, but things to look at when you're first fixating a lead. Uh, thresholds will initially rise with current of injury. So when you see the initial current of injury here, um, you may see a high threshold as well. As long as you have a good injury current, I would not be concerned um, with a high threshold initially. Um, but if you have no injury current of all, if you have that narrow um, EGM like that, that indicates that, you know, you're probably pacing into dead tissue or you have poor fixation. If you have a negative injury current and you have a high threshold, suspect it could be uh, perforation. So, um, Atrial thresholds tend to be more dynamic. This is just something I've personally seen is that when you really cause a lot of injury in the atrium, uh, you tend to see a, a high initial fixation threshold. It could be around three volts. It could be as much as five. But as long as you have a good injury current, um, I would give it time. It usually takes about 20 or so minutes, maybe even five minutes for the stir steroid elution to set in. Um, and you'll see those thresholds fall. So uh, fixation threshold, you may see around three or possibly greater, but generally you wanna see less than three in both. Um, you give it around 15, 20 minutes, you may see it get to you know, less than 1.5, less than one in the ventricle. Typically we wanna see around 0.5 or 0.25 ideally, but you take what you can get, right? Um, and then chronically, you may see this rise over time. We don't see this as much. So if you're seeing this on all of your patients where you have an initial threshold of like 0.5, and then it's around two, um, a couple of days later, there's something, you know, this isn't common now with steroid elution. Steroid elution has made a massive impact in our acute to chronic thresholds, which we will show in a later slide. So um, they should be low at implant. You expect they may rise, but not guaranteed. Um, and then these are suggested values, obviously. So um, it may not be the same for every patient. Here we see steroid elution versus um, the initial electrodes. The original electrodes tended to be like a smooth uh, metal electrode at the tip. 
Later, they ended up adding a textured electrode. This just increases the surface area. So it literally just has little bitty bumps and grooves all over it. Um, this increases the amount of tissue surface area, allowing for um, a greater or less impedance, um, better thresholds. And then um, with steroid elution, you know, um, we've seen a much less marked increase in threshold over time. So back in the day, when you initially put in these, you know, textured non-steroid elute leads, you may see a pretty substantial increase in threshold of about three weeks, four weeks, settling out around five to six weeks. Now with steroid elution, it's much less apparent. Um, and generally six weeks is a good indicator that you're, that's going to be your stable uh, threshold moving forward, unless you have some sort of issue with the device or the lead. So um, you, I don't think you'll come across non-steroid eluting leads. Manufacturers may make some special ones um, that don't have like the dexamethasone or um, you know whatever steroid they use. Um, that could be for patients with allergies or things like that. But typically, every one you'll see will have steroid elution. All right. So what can affect capture, um, activity level, posture? Once again, time of day, comorbidity. So increasing heart failure. It can even be anything like they can uh, affect their electrolytes like meals, drugs, and then progression of disease like sarcoid or anything like that. Um, here's just a little you know, image of non-capture where the device is attempting and not capturing. So we had talked about capture and the safety margin. Um, so just remember that, you know, Programming your final pulse amplitude and pulse width is, uh, is a balancing act, as I like to call it, um, because you want to make sure that you have a good margin um, to capture, but you also want to understand that thresholds fluctuate over time, um, um, but you don't want to tax the battery too much. So typically, we just do a two-time safety margin. Uh, you may have an auto capture algorithm on. Those are either beat by beat and they'll add a small margin or if they're not beat by beat, um, they'll set some sort of like two to one or one volt margin above and remeasure itself. Um, for dependent patients, you know, it's, it's very important that you have these safety margins in place. For patients who aren't dependent, but you're worried about battery, you can maybe, you know, fudge the numbers a little bit. But just keep in mind, um, you know, you do want to uh, give yourself a safety margin for if they change. Um, so we've kind of dealt with these conflicting demands by decreasing the battery or de decreasing the device size while still um, improving the battery um, technology. Um, but, you know, if you ever have questions about how to optimize a battery with Abbott devices, feel free to reach out to me. If it's a Medtronic, Boston, Bio device. I can guide you through it, but um, I'm not going to be your expert on that. So feel free to reach out to any of our friends in the field on that. Um, safety margins, generally two to one, three to one safety margin, automated capture algorithms, they kind of do their own thing. Um, for left ventricular leads, you tend to not maintain a two to one margin. Uh, you'll do like a one volt margin on top or even 0.5. Um, as long as you have that RV lead as a backup, it's not as concerning. Um, so you just want to try to stretch that battery as much as possible. And obviously, since some of these patients are receiving reprocessed devices, it's more important to uh, to optimize battery as much as possible, just because they may not have, you know, their original longevity. All right. So now we get to sensing. Sensing threshold described the smallest intrinsic um, atrial ventricular signals, which can be consistently, once again, consistent, comes into play, um, sensed by the pacemaker. Um, so in order to assess your sensing thresholds, you can either do the decrement test where you, uh, or sorry, the increment test where you will slowly raise the sensing until you lose cat or until you lose the ability to sense. Um, or you can do just a measurement of amplitude, which I'll show you here on this next slide. Um, the thing to be aware of with any of these though, is that PVCs tend to be taller, uh, you know, these tall, ugly, ugly signals here. And you could have a greater than 12 volt PVC, but the intrinsic could only be, you know, six millivolts. So if you have a 12 millivolt PVC and a six millivolt intrinsic, but we measure it off the PVC, we may only set our sensitivity at that two to one, and we could be missing the intrinsic. So always be aware when you're programming sensitivity that you're actually sensing the intrinsic and not PVCs. So. In that previous poll question, I asked you 
Um, to, if you raise the sensitivity, was it do? So raising the sensitivity value, so raising this fence here, if we raised it to instead of um, 1.25, we'll raise it to say two here, two millivolts. We are making the device less sensitive. Uh, reasons why you may raise this, say this is your QRS, this is your T wave. You want to make sure that the sensing is high enough to sense the intrinsic QRS, but miss the T wave here. So um, always keep in mind, you know, when you're evaluating sensitivity that um, you're kind of, you're kind of, you're playing a game to make sure you're missing anything that you're not supposed to see, like intrinsic noise, myopotentials. potentials. Um, if you make the device too sensitive, it could sense these and inhibit pacing. Um, however, if you make it too high, you could miss the intrinsic, and now the device is going to be pacing necessarily when it shouldn't be, which if you remember, we are talking about asynchronous pacing. Um, it, this is essentially the same thing. If the device is blind, it's going to pace no matter what, and it could pace in a vulnerable uh, zone and kick off an arrhythmia. So things to keep in mind there. Safety margin, same as we have with capture. Um, you know, our, we defined our safety margin as to allow it to reliably sense um, even with the fluctuations that we see in sensing. So you want at least a uh, two to one, as we always have. So half the size of the smallest. So if we measure an R wave at six millivolts, we want our sensing to be around three millivolts. Um, things like T waves can convolute if they have very tall T waves. Um, you know, So it's just things to keep in mind that we're just trying to program around what we have here. Pretty straightforward. Okay. I'm going to go ahead, actually, launch another poll. <clears throat> so impedance is, anyone want to take a guess at what impedance is? The measure of current flow in an electrical circuit, the sum of all forces opposing the flow of current in a circuit, or measured in microamps. Wow, that was super quick. Still got some answers flowing in here. Um, by the way, I think we can still ask our questions. You can drop them in the chat. Um, that would help a lot. Yeah. Or you raise you. your hand so you can ask a question. Awesome. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please, please chime in. Okay. Looks like we got enough here. Go ahead and end the poll share the results for you. Impedance is, um, the answer is the sum of all forces opposing the flow of current in a circuit. So um, impedance is a measure of resistance. Um, so when you're looking at an electrical circuit, it's the resistance in the circuit. Measure of current flow in an electrical circuit, um, that's actually going to be microamperes and micro and current is a, is a different measurement. So when we're evaluating leads, we're looking at um, we're looking at capture, we're looking at sensing, and we're looking at impedance, which we'll get to here. Move this out of the way. All right. Let's see. So brings us to impedance. Some of all forces opposing flow in a circuit. Uh, that's the resistance, and we'll kind of go over a little deeper dive here in a second. Um, it typically has a pretty broad range, so 300 to 1500, uh, depending on the lead, depending on the patient. You know, uh, a big thing we're looking at is stability in impedance. So um, here I gave you an example of like a lead trend of stability. This is what we want to see. We want to see that at fixation we have this stable impedance over time. For some of these reprocessed devices, you may have. Um, you may have old signals that we talked about um, a couple of weeks ago. You may have old impedance measurements from before the device was implanted. I think you chimed in about something there, um, uh, you know, Elvis, where you may see this impedance value and then all of a sudden you'll see the impedance value up here. This is where the device was um, not implanted in a patient. This is the old, the old patient values not implanted. And then all of a sudden you'll have this normal trend here. That's completely fine yes. for a reprocessed device because this yes. doesn't matter. 
this means it wasn't in a patient at all. And then this is the trend you want to pay attention to. This is why it's so important to put your implant date in the device. So we know from this point on, this is where we're evaluating the impedance. Um, yeah, you could also notice a space in between the values, the previous trend and the current trend. Um, there's usually a space because um, the time that's representing the time between which it was processed and then implanted in a new patient. So that could also help. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, what will we end up happening, depending on the device, um, it may have an alert where impedance is out of range, um, greater than 2000 or whatever the range is set at. Um, and that would be your, your out of range that that gap he's talking about here, where the device is not in a patient. And then obviously from your implant date on, that's where you evaluate the trend. Um, so what can affect it? So it's the, re, uh, the resistance of the conductor coils itself. So as the electricity flows um, on the lead itself, you know, uh, the lead conductor uh, size can, can have an effect on how easy it flows in, the uh, interface with the tissue itself. So whether or not it has good tissue contact, um, the, we have here, and then size of the electrode and then shape of the tip electrode. So everything, you know, that all just kind of plays a factor. And since there are many different leads, patients have different, you know, um, different hearts, you're not going to see, um, you're not going to see the same number every single time. You're generally going to see some variability in your impedance. So what you're looking for as um, is stability within that specific patient. So it's okay if you have a higher impedance, just remember that impedance is out of range could indicate an issue. So let me get to my quizzes here. All right, got one for you here. So we have an 85 year old male um, with a pacemaker implant in 1996, gen change in 2005. Um, everything has been normal, comes into your office complaining of lightheadedness and fatigue. And you say, hey, let's go ahead and take a look at the device. You interrogate his pacemaker and find the ventricular impedance is uh, 1800 ohms. Uh, it's usually trending around 700 ohms. So we're going to start this quiz question. What do you believe occurred with this patient? Do we think that, um, I don't know why it says choice, ignore that, but it says lead, is there a lead insulation breach? Is there lead mineralization? Is there lead conductor failure or a death of localized tissue? Feel free to chime in for this poll. So do we think that the insulation is breached? Do we think that the conductor is failing? Do we think that there is a buildup of mineralization um, on the electrodes of the lead itself? Or do we think that the localized tissue has died and the device is not able to capture? We, we have an answer in the chat saying um, lead fracture. We want to count that into the poll. Okay, we'll count that one as, as that. Please don't let it influence your answers though, everyone else. All right, I'd say that's enough for that. Let me go ahead and share your results. Looks like someone got it in the last moment. Okay, so most of you said lead conductor failure. That is the correct answer. Um, a lead insulation breach, you would see a drop in impedance. Uh, lead mineralization, you would see a slow rise. Conductor failure would usually indicate um, that there is, or a sudden impedance rise would usually indicate conductor failure. Let's take a look here as it jumps for me. So in this specific case, they took a look and yeah, there is a failure here. If you see right there, there's your clavicle. Um, so we have maybe some clavicular crush or something going on, but it caused the uh, the conductor to be severed there. So the lead is no longer uh, going to be viable. Um, things to keep in mind is that you may see, if we had here this trend, you may see sudden jumps in impedance and then drops back down to baseline or jumps back and forth throughout, this could indicate what is called, um, you know, like it, it can indicate that the conductor is, is fractured right here. 
but occasionally it's separated. There's a gap. And then occasionally it's actually, you know, just pushed together. So you end up with the lead may function and capture half the time when the, when the conductor is being pushed together, when they stretch and it causes that separation, the device, uh, the electrical impulse can no longer go through the lead itself. Um, so you have maybe non-capture, you may have over sensing or no sensing, and you may have impedance out of range. Um, one thing is the impedance is taken at random points throughout the day. So it may not pick up when this occurs. So you may not have this manifest. Um, things like this, you can actually come in and test by bringing the patient in and having them, you know, do isometrics, moving their arms around, um, looking for any kind of over sensing or loss of capture um, noise, or you can even check check impedances during stretching. But just keep in mind for dependent patients that if you do this, you could cause it to not capture um, and you could make the situation much worse. So always just be ready just in case for dependent patients. All right, let me get back to my polls here. So I'll skip one. All right, we're getting through it. <clears throat> Lessing, assessing lead integrity. Once again, you assess your capture, you assess your impedance, you assess your sensing, um, especially with sensing. Is the sensing value good? Do we have a bunch of little noise? Um, issues that we're sensing up? Do we have uh, myopotentials potentials being picked up when they stretch or flex their muscles? Um, you also analyze the changes. Is it a sudden jump in impedance uh, or a sudden fall in impedance, sudden change in threshold, sudden fall, sudden change in sensing, or is it something that's trending over time? Um, trends over time could indicate issues with tissue, could indicate mineralization, um, while sudden jumps could indicate um, issues with the conductor or the um, or the insulation. Here's a little article, interesting one to read. You can just Google this concept though, and there'll be a million of them where people have evaluated impedance as um, a way to tell. So I think I just got ahead of myself. Let's see. No, I think we're good. All right, last few slides here. All right, so um, impedance is an indicator of lead integrity. So just remember a drop in impedance, um, which means lower resistance is a possible insulation breach. Um, a jump in impedance or a higher resistance is a conductor failure typically. And then a slow, ri lies, a slow rise in impedance could be um, electrode calcification. It could be also tissue interface issues but it just means that there's something that is blocking the electrical impulse from leaving. Um, so just remember that sensing may not change at all, but threshold may change. Up close, we see a um, exposed conductor, and here we see a damaged conductor. Um, this looks like it's the outer ring. The, the uh, inner tip could still be insulated and fine. So remember that um, if you have issues with your um, capture or sensing or impedance, you can always check your unipolar because the unipolar could be, or the uh, the tip could be protected with an insulation, but the outer ring um, conductor could be the one that's damaged. A good way to kind of visualize this though is a hose, right? So the uh, the water is your electrical impulse. The outside yeah. of the hose is your insulation. If you have a hole in your hose, that means that electricity or water is escaping which means that there's less resistance of the electricity traveling through the hose. There's just not as much back pressure because once again, we're limited by the size of the tip, the interface here. Opening up more holes means electricity flows easier outside, which causes a decrease in impedance. So a lower resistance, a drop in impedance means a possible uh, insulation breach versus higher resistance we're actually causing a kink or a knot in your hose where the electricity is having difficulty or no ability to travel through um, through to escape and capture tissue locally. So in these cases, when you see a rise in resistance or a sudden jump in resistance, that um, could indicate a uh, issue with the conductor being damaged itself. You can also get a combination of both um, where you have maybe make break signals um, but also an insulation breach. So just keep in mind that if there's a big change up and down in um, your trend over time, there's probably some sort of issue with the lead. 
Finally, pacemaker magnet function. I just added this in just so we can go over it. Once again, I use the St. Jude because that's what I programmed for many years. And those are the ones I'm familiar with. Whenever you're placing a magnet on the device, just remember that the strongest magnetic current is around the actual ring itself, not in the center. So you want to have the strongest magnetic field over the middle of the device um, where the battery, uh, sorry, where the circuit is. So for an ICD, for example, you have your header, you have your circuit board around here, you have your battery and your capacitor down here. So you want to place the middle across there to activate the electrical read switch um, that will put the device in a uh, in a, either a VOO, DOO, AOO mode in a pacemaker or um, turn off tachytherapy in a defibrillator. So once again, uh, magnet response for an Abbott pacemaker is to typically program it asynchronous unless it's been otherwise specified, which is not typical. Um, and then in an ICD, it disables tachytherapy. We talk about your, um, your battery rate as a way to indicate battery longevity. Uh, so your, your battery voltage, uh, when you actually look at the current drain or the battery life of an Abbott device, it will show you your battery um, rate. It starts at around 100. And when it's near depletion, it's 85 beats a minute. So a good way to evaluate a, um, a battery without a programmer is, is to place a magnet over the pacemaker itself. You'll see it um, increase the rate accordingly. So if it's programmed at 60 beats a minute, you place a magnet over the device itself, it will pace at the battery rate asynchronously. So if it's pacing, you know, 99 beats a minute asynchronously, that indicates the battery is still healthy. If it's pacing 85, 84 beats a minute, um, that indicates the battery is very depleted and you need to, um, you need to consider it interrogating and changing it out. Um, when you look at battery longevity and battery voltage, you kind of have this linear trend and then a pretty quick decline. So you may see a battery that has like 50% capacity that is still pacing at like 98 beats a minute. Um, if it's getting down to 85, you know, this is pretty close to depleted battery. So um, once again, you leave the magnet of the device the entire time for asynchronous pacing, or you place the magnet over the device for an ICD to turn off tachytherapy. Say the patient's going in for surgery, this is a good way um, so that you don't have to reprogram it afterwards. All right. Anybody have any questions for me there? Uh, no questions yet. Okay, so I've already taken up an hour of your time, um, more so than that, actually. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. I appreciate everybody for joining. Um, if you have anything following, you know, feel free to reach out to me directly or post in the masterclass group and we can go over this. I will be posting this on YouTube. Um, so uh, you'll be able to review it later. But uh, I appreciate everybody for participating in the polls. This is my first time using uh, polls, so we can tell. Um, you know, hit some growing pains, but I appreciate all the participation. Um, our next scheduled talk, we'll have the announcement out soon, but Jared will be um, shortly picking up on um, additional device um, and lead, um, you know, uh, structure and, and learning about how those, how those function. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I appreciate you coming out. Uh, thank you very much, AJ. Great lecture. Uh, maybe, perhaps I should just throw in a question, oh, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so regards um, pacemaker magnetic function, um, I think there's a point where we need to apply caution um, in using magnets for pacemakers, especially when um, for a patient who is not regular on follow-up and um, possibly might have some um, pacemaker issues. You know, if the pacemaker is close to end of life or end of service, you know, what what would you advise to be the likely um, precautions that one could take in case, you know, the patient somehow is in within that category so that they can manage, especially when the patient is dependent? So I don't... Uh... Someone can maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't see an issue necessarily with using a magnet to evaluate battery on a very depleted device. 
Um, one thing that I have seen happen is interrogating a device that is almost like fully completed, the interrogation could knock it out. So if, if the device is at EOL and has been for some period of time, if you interrogate it, there is a slight chance that it could just kill the device entirely. Um, EOL is, you know, it's end of life with the device or EOS, they may call it end of service. Um, and you have to be very wary of that because we just don't, we, we're not able to predict how the device will respond. Um, so I think Mag is still a fine way to interpret it, but I think what you're saying is basically like you, you need to interrogate, we need to follow up on these patients, correct? Well, I'm particular about a patient, for instance, just an hypothetical case, a patient who is not regular on pull up. Maybe you could find like recently I saw a patient who had the ICD implanted in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I've never done any interrogation, although it was implanted outside Nigeria. Yes, I could understand that was way back 2014. Um, but ever since then, till this week, he had not gone for any interrogation. Fortunately, gotcha. it was an ICD. And, uh, you know, kind of the battery life was still two years plus. I was quite surprised. Well, he, you know, it's ICD and implanted for primary prevention. So no much activity. There has not been any shock. But in that kind of situation where you have someone who is on pacemaker, dependent, what precaution, is there any precaution you know, to just take in case you want to use the magnet approach? Should it, is there any precaution? I'm just speculating about precautions that we could adopt when taking that approach for those kind of patients if we must use a battery, a magnet on their device? Well, so for the, for a defibrillator, you know, magnet's not going to tell you anything, right? Like you only know if a Definitely. defibrillator magnet is working is if you use um, cautery next to it and the patient doesn't get shocked. Um, sure, so there's sure. not really, it's, it's not a good indicator for pacemakers. You know, you can use it as a way to evaluate battery, but as you said, it's, it's not the best way to do it. It it's not, you're not really seeing what's going on with the device. It's been in this case, you know, what, uh, nine years since it was checked. Uh, there could be any number of issues with the device. We just don't know about. So, um, interrogation is always key, but for a device that's that depleted, no matter what you're doing, you want to be ready on hand to either do, you know, epicardial pacing or, you know, CPR if necessary, yeah. if for some reason the device fails, um, just because we we cannot predict what the device is going to do when it's at end of service or end of life. And to your point, I, I can't tell you that a magnet wouldn't knock out pacing um, because if it's just barely hanging on there, conceivably it, it could have an effect. Generally, I think it, it, it'll it be fine, but you need to interrogate it. You need to be ready that when a device is extremely depleted, we just can't predict what it's going to do. Um, and that's why we don't want to just leave devices in there, um, even if they're not dependent, because you could have pacemaker runaway. Um, if you think about it, like the pacemaker is like a brain, not a very smart one. It just does what it's programmed to do. But as the battery is drained, the brain is not able to function as well. And we just can't predict what the brain is going to do, how it's going to react um, as it enters EOL or EOS. So no matter what you're doing, you know, be ready for things to go south in a device that is uh, overly depleted. Other things to remember too, is that some older devices, um, Abbott, for example, um, I have to look into it, but like they are eight or nine year old devices. Um, if you use cautery diathermy right over the device itself, it can cause it to knock out the electrical circuit um, and or go asynchronous or go to a um, unipolar pacing structure so that either the device stops pacing entirely or when you pull it out of the pocket, it no longer captures because it's unipolar. So, um, you know, older devices are not as predictable of what they're going to do. So you just always want to have your hands ready. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Um, Elvis, I mean, do you have any other input on any of the other stuff we talked about? I know we covered a lot today. So if you have anything you wanted to touch on, um, we'd love to learn from your wealth of knowledge. <laughs> Well, uh, nothing much. You, you've, you've answered all the questions, and you know, I, I really learned a lot from the answers you gave. So, yeah. okay, <laughs> I I appreciate. I'll take that compliment. But I, I appreciate you all sticking through me. Um, once again, you know this. Uh, I was a substitute teacher today, so hopefully we all 
Um, you know, we learned something value from, valuable from it. Um, if there's anything that I might have missed or you have any questions about, um, you know, I didn't have as much prep, prep time as I would like. So um, please feel free to reach out and we can we can go over anything you might have. Um, we're all learning this together. You know, we're all just trying to be uh, be better and serve our patients better. So if you do have any questions, you know, this is this is what it's all here for. So raise your hand, engage, and um, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, enjoy your Sunday. Thanks again. Yeah, you too.